I love cooking and I love teaching people how to cook. Good food is so important, not just for our health, but for our temperament, and it doesn't need to be complicated. For this series, I've created a set of menus which I hope you will try, either as individual dishes or as a complete and balanced meal. We're so lucky to have some of the best raw ingredients in the world. Let's make the most of them. How easy is it to make your own cheese? Honestly, much easier than you think. And if you've ever wanted to make your own cheese, try making labna. The name suggests an exotic origin, and labna is a dripped yogurt cheese from the Middle East. And for a rich and creamy result, search out full fat yogurt here. The labna adds the savory note to beetroot and raspberries, which taste very good together and all combined with honey and mint to create a light and refreshing starter. So I'm going to start off by making the labna, and this couldn't be easier. What you need is some really good quality yogurt, and there's fantastic yogurt being produced all over Ireland at the moment, so that's not going to be too difficult. And we're going to drip the yogurt through muslin. So this, about a minimum of eight hours for this, or you can do it overnight, which is what I normally do. Now this yogurt that I'm using has got lovely sort of buttery, creamy, top on, which you could leave in the yogurt, but I'm going to just spoon that off. And then what I've got here, I've got some muslin. So this is a double fold of what you call butter muslin. And just for the moment, I'm sitting it over a sieve like that in a bowl. So you simply just decant your yogurt into the bowl. And the purpose of the exercise here is to drain off the whey off the yogurt. That's the sort of liquidy whey, which will all become very obvious in a moment. So you're really making a sort of a cheese here, a yogurt cheese. I mean, it couldn't be easier. So who'd have thought that you could be a cheese maker in your own kitchen at home with such ease? So to simply gather up the uh, corners of your muslin. So I'm just putting a knot, a double knot. And all I'm going to do then quite simply with this is to hang it. And I don't know if you can see already, yes, already a little of the whey is starting to drain off. So I usually hang it up on a cup hook or something like that. And once that's been dripping overnight or for a minimum of eight hours, so it could be first thing in the morning for using that evening for dinner, it's going to look like this, okay? You see how much whey drips off? That's one of the trendiest ingredients now in, in kitchens who are practicing um, sort of new modern cooking. So we just have to remove our string. There we go. And in here we have a very, very simple beautiful cheese. So I'm just going to put that into a nice bowl and we keep it cold. At this point then you definitely chill it, okay? Really lovely and gentle and I'm handling it with a degree of sort of care and respect because I think it's such a beautiful thing. Now I'm just going to make a little bit of dressing which we're going to be serving with the beetroot and the labneh and our raspberries and mint. So it's a very um, simple dressing um, using olive oil and lemon juice. And here I'm doing four tablespoons of olive oil and then I'm doing two tablespoons of lemon juice. So this has just been squeezed from a lemon. So a nice level of fat, vegetable fat from the olives, a nice level of acidity from the lemon. The other ingredient I love to put in here is a little bit of honey. So I've got lovely Irish honey in my lovely little Balik, um honey pot. It's just a very precious thing that I love. Dribble that in. That's about a teaspoon of honey. You can measure it onto your spoon if you want to. A little bit more. And again, local honey. The, the honey that is most local to you will be the best thing here. And remember, that's a honey made uh, in cities and towns as well as all over the countryside. Pinch of salt and a little pepper. And that's, again, a classic vinaigrette. So why am I adding the honey in here today? Because the labne is just a little bit sharp. So just to give a balance of flavor. I don't want it to be overly sweet, but I just want the flavors to be really, really good. So a little black pepper, a whisk to mix everything up. If you only made one dressing in your life, as I sometimes say, and it was this, it'll go to most of the, the places where a vinaigrette is appropriate. So I'll put that there with the labne. Now, we're going to concentrate on the cooking of the beetroot. Uh, they're covered with water and then a nice pinch of salt and a small pinch of sugar, just to lift the flavor, not to make them taste artificially sweet, but just to lift the flavor. Lid on. So I'm going to put those over there out of the way and I've got some cooked here already. So I'm going to lift one out of the pot. 
So to tell if they're cooked, just push the skin like that. And see the way it just comes away very gently with my thumb. And that tells me the beetroot are completely cooked. Okay, then just continue peeling them. And it just, should just rub away with virtually no resistance. And that is pretty much that. The beetroot I'm going to just slice. You can slice this by hand if you want to. I'm going to slice it on a mandolin. Use the safety guard if you wish. And I want thin-ish slices like that. Not too thick or too thin. So use your safety guard when you get down to the stage where it gets a little bit close to the blade like that and you get these beautiful thin slices yeah they're about a millimeter thick you can do a formal pattern if you want but i'm kind of going to do this a little bit more kind of abstract depends how busy you are and sometimes abstract or informality is not necessarily a priority when you're cooking at home for for a hungry mouth okay just like that so it's not a lot an awful lot of beetroot okay the next thing i'm going to put on are the raspberries um, and you can put just whole raspberries on like that if you want to. I'll pop a couple on whole. But I love to cut them open as well. So you see this lovely sort of shiny, glossy inside of the raspberry, which just adds a, an extra dimension. Really nice, simple flavours here. Sort of nearly invigorating flavours, you'd call them. Now, a little bit of our dressing. So this is our olive oil, honey and lemon juice dressing. So give it a whisk up. And we spoon a little of this over. Then our labna, which is kind of the, we won't say the star of the show because everything here is star, stars. But just take a scoop like that. And then sometimes I like to um, just put a little dimple in the labne. Uh, so then I can spoon a little dressing. So the first little bit of labne you taste has got a little sort of trapped piece of dressing in it, which is really nice. A little sprinkle of salt. A little sprinkle of pepper, a tiny bit of heat, and then finally um, some mint. And as you can imagine, the way the flavours of the mint are just going to work beautifully here. And that is pretty much that. Do we need just a tiny little bit more dressing around the edge? Simple, light, refreshing. You've made your own cheese. Brilliant. fascinating to see how salads have moved from being modest side dishes to the main event. This is a light and fresh tasting salad and it is delightful to be able to use Irish quail as there are several producers now rearing these lovely birds here at home. They always feel like a treat and the sweet and succulent flesh is delicious. Serve the salad on a hot plate otherwise the quail will cool too quickly and become greasy. I like to crack open walnuts from the shell when using them and that way I am generally guaranteed a fresh and sweet flavour from the nuts. The pomegranate molasses used in the dressing is made from the juice of bitter pomegranates and it adds a lovely gentle sharpness to the dressing. So continuing with the somewhat Middle Eastern theme with our starter with the labne, um, we're going to have a lightly spiced quail and to serve with the quail I want some crispy potatoes. So I've got some lovely Irish potatoes which I've just diced, about one centimetre size diced, but you don't need to get your ruler out for this. So I've got a frying pan, a good heavy frying pan ideally on over here. I'm using olive oil. You could use, again, duck fat, goose fat, something like that if you want to. What's very important is that the oil is nice and hot before you put your potatoes into the pan. So no salt at this stage, no seasoning of any description, your fat of choice, olive oil in my case, and the potatoes. And then just turn the potatoes. Keep an eye on your heat. Don't allow the heat to become too low or don't allow the heat to become too high. Uh, otherwise, they'll either stew or just burn on the outside and not be cooked in the middle, okay? In the meantime, I can go ahead and prepare my quail. So these are lovely Irish quail. It's wonderful there are several uh, producers producing beautiful Irish quail. And I begin by just cutting the quail in half, like that. Everything still attached. Lovely. And into a dish, and the same with this. And then we'll go ahead and we're going to um, roast and grind some spices to serve with the quail. And I, generally speaking, roast spices separately. So I get my heat on here under my pan. I'm just going to put my star anise on over there, my coriander on at this side, spread them out flat, and my cumin. And the reason you roast them and toast them before you uh, grind them, that just releases the essential oils and brings a completely different level of flavour. It just makes them really fantastic. And while you're watching your spices, give an eye on your potatoes. Nothing dramatic, 
to note there. One or two little bits starting to catch on the bottom. That's not a problem, but scrape up where it starts to catch. And that lovely flavor and color that develops will just eventually be amalgamated right the way through those. All so far, so good there. Now what's happening in here? So the cumin is ready. So I'm going to pop that off the pan and into the pestle and mortar. These are all ready now. You'll start when they leave the pan to get the aroma of the spices. But it's not until you pound them up and grind them that you really get that just magical, just freshly roasted and freshly um, ground spice aroma. Okay, and there we go. And because they sort of become slightly drier and crisper, as any of us would if we were put on a frying pan for a period of time, they um, are easier to roast. And I don't want them absolutely, completely finely ground here. There can be a little bit of coarseness, but the aroma that comes up out of the pan is fantastic. And that's what the sort of level of grind that I'm after, like that. So that can just go straight onto the quail. So all of that on there. A little drizzle of olive oil like that. A little lemon juice, and spices love lemon. The flavors work really well. But before I put the juice of the lemon in, I'm also going to put some um, lemon zest. This is just gorgeous. Well, hopefully it's gonna be just gorgeous. Like that. And then what else do I need to put in there? I need to put in a little pinch of salt. Like that. And also a little lemon juice. Give the quail a little turn, because I want the spice to be inside and outside. Right, let's just check our potatoes and see what's happening over here. When I turn them now, we should be starting, yeah, we're starting to see a bit of color. Right, I'm going to go ahead and put my quail on to cook actually at this stage. So a heavy cast iron grill pan like this, skin side down first. Lovely, leaving a little space between them and we'll keep an eye on them. These will take about 20 minutes in total to cook. You can start them off on top if you want to, color them really well and put them into a moderate oven and that also works brilliantly. Get closer to your cooking with Neff Slide and Hide. Proud sponsor of How to Cook Well with Rory O'Connell. So while they're cooking there, I am going to prepare the rest of the ingredients for the salad element of this particular dish. And as always when you're grilling or pan frying, don't play with them too much. Leave them alone for the first few minutes so they can develop a lovely crust and a lovely color. So over here, I have the rest of my ingredients. I've got some walnuts. You can buy pre-shelled walnuts if you want to. I personally uh, buy walnuts in the shell and then I use my pestle and mortar just to crack them open, okay? I don't need too many for this particular recipe, so honestly, it's pretty straightforward. The other thing I need is some pomegranate seeds. I think the whole, we're all very familiar with pomegranate seeds now. So I can extract these from the pomegranate by cutting it half horizontally. This is a particularly beautifully colored, deep ruby color in this pomegranate. So um, I can extract a few of these seeds and have those ready. So just beat the pomegranate like that and the seeds just fall down through your slightly splayed fingers. Now when you tap the seeds out of the little casings that they're in, just check to see if any of the little papery um, sections have popped in and some of them have, so just, just pick them out like that, okay? That'll be enough for my salad there actually. That little papery skin, that won't do you any harm, it's quite high in tannin. And tannin, um, these are slightly bitter sort of taste, a bitter sort of, sort of coating on your mouth, but it won't do you any harm. So let's look back at our quail for a moment, because these guys could be ready to be turned now. And I'm going to move my pan around, because I have a slightly higher heat down here and a lower heat up there. So let's just have a little look. Beautiful, perfect. Everything cooking away nicely there. Okay, and I'm going to use um, three tablespoons of my walnut oil. Walnut oil is a beautiful thing, and the somewhat thick, as you can see, pomegranate molasses. You can make your own pomegranate molasses, by the way, by juicing a fresh pomegranate like I had there and reducing it in the juice in a saucepan. But it will be different because we don't get the bitter varieties of pomegranate in this part of the world. Definitely, a pinch of salt and a pinch of pepper, and I need to look at my potatoes. It's all kicking off here now. 
Okay, so the potatoes are looking good now. So keep a good eye on these when they're cooking. They're very nearly tender. Still no salt in. That'll be just at the very last minute. Our chopped garlic going in, because I want the garlic to cook for a few minutes to take the raw flavour off the garlic. And then a little bit of rosemary just pulled in off the stalk like that. So yeah, that's great. The rosemary will start to collapse, some of it will crisp up, and the garlic will get sort of mildly sort of tenderised. So I'm pretty much ready to plate up the salad now. So, nice big serving dish, plenty of space. Our salad leaves, central to a salad. Our dressing, so remember our uh, pomegranate molasses, olive oil, salt and pepper. So pop that on there. A little gentle mix. And then just decant everything onto your serving dish. Okay, that's looking lovely, just sitting up nicely. I'm going to turn the heat off under my quail there because they're cooked. Then our walnuts, take the last little bit of your dressing just to coat the walnuts. So these freshly cracked walnuts have a deliciously sweetie sort of flavour. And you can imagine that the textures are going to be wonderful. Okay, then our quail. So just lift those onto the salad. So in France they'd call this a salad tiède, a warm salad. And it's almost like they're sitting in a little nest of leaves. And then a little sprinkle of pomegranate seeds, just a last little sort of embellishment. So this is ready to be served. So the only thing we need now to finish the meal are our potatoes. Finally, and only at this point, do we pop in a little bit of salt, give that a stir in. They're crispy and golden, and these are the perfect accompaniment, really. And don't forget to scrape up any of the little bits just in the bottom of the pan like that, because they have their own special flavour, as long as they're not black. Uh, if you want to, at this stage, just before you take it to the table, we'll just put another little sprig of rosemary just on there, just because the colour is so nice with on that plate. Just loosen them out a little bit. So the golden crispy potatoes, caramelised garlic, rosemary, kind of smoky flavours in there. Lovely with the sweet, more mildly sort of smoky pomegranate and walnut flavours there. I love this combination. I'm never quite sure if I should call this next dish a cake or a tart, but in any event it is delicious and quite easy to make. The origins of this recipe are in Tuscany, but I like to use highly perfumed Irish dessert apples when they're in season. Look out for lesser known but very delicious Irish dessert apples, such as the Irish peach and the Ardcairn russet. So for the apple cake, or the Tuscan dessert apple cake, if you want to give it its full title, um, I've got my tin ready. So I have a, um, a flan tin with a removable base, and I've just lined it with a disc of parchment paper, which I've buttered, just brushed with a bit of melted butter. That makes sure it's definitely not going to stick to the paper on you. So that's ready to go, and my oven is on preheated. So after that, I need to start preparing my apples. So it's dessert apples, so um, any kind of sweet apple rather than a bitter apple. So I start off by peeling the apples. I like much prefer to use a vegetable peeler rather than a knife because I find the shape is much nicer. You can say that's overly fussy, but it does preserve the lovely round shape of an apple. So that's it. That was very clever, wasn't it? Putting my peels straight into my already prepared apple slices. We'll fish those out. Then I'm going to quarter the apple and core it. Um, then slice these uh, in with the rest. And then I'm going to put lots of nice lemon zest in with them. So the zest of two lemons going in, so you can imagine the lovely flavour that that's going to bring um, to the equation. And then just turn that through. Now for the actual cake mixture itself, um, I'm using almonds. So I've just peeled my almonds by putting them into cold water and bringing them up to the boil. I like the gritty texture that these almonds give to the tart. There's a particular sort of lovely, tiny little, almost imperceptible crunch. So we just grind these. So I'm grinding them to a grit. Yeah, okay. So now they're slightly finer looking. Perfect. Okay, so that's those. Apples ready um, um, and almonds ready. We've got eggs and sugar. So I pop these into a bowl. I'm going to whisk these. It only takes a matter of moments just to whisk them together. So break in your eggs. The better quality your eggs are, um, the better the result and the more delicious the result is going to be. A little vanilla extract, one teaspoon of vanilla. 
Pop that in. I'm using a little handheld electric mixer here, which is perfect for the job. So start it off slowly so it doesn't fly all over the place, and then speed things up. That's pretty much that. Just a sort of a froth like that, just nice and fluffy and light. That is pretty much perfect. So we're going to add in um, our flour. So in here I've got my flour and my baking powder already measured, and I like to sieve that in just to make sure there aren't going to be any lumps. So just sieve that in, okay. And I'm also going to add in uh, the cream. I'm just gonna pour the cream in there around the edge and my melted butter. And when you melt butter, you'll notice sometimes you get a little creamy substance on the bottom. Make sure all of the creamy substance, that's some of the little bits of salt and delicious sediments, make sure all of that goes in, because that's where a lot of the flavor in the butter is. And we'll fold those through with the almonds. So the lovely gritty textured almonds will add a really, really lovely texture and flavor. So fold all that through. So it's sort of like a batter, really, right down to the bottom to get the melted butter, which tends to race to the bottom of the bowl, back up. Okay, and that's it. Look around you to make sure you haven't forgotten any of your ingredients, which I don't think I have. And now we add three quarters of the apples in here. Now, if you've added all of them in, don't panic. It doesn't make too much difference. We keep some of the apples just for sprinkling on top. Fold those in, trying just not to break up the apple pieces. Again, that would not be entirely a disaster. So the tin lined with parchment paper. This tart tends not to stick. And apart from the butter, as I mentioned earlier, helping it definitely not to stick, imagine the butter around the sides goes brilliantly. So think of the flavors in here, apple, butter, sugar, vanilla, and almond. This is a classic combination of flavors. I'll scrape all of that out, flatten it out a little bit, and then the apples that you reserved sprinkle over the top. And these then get slightly caramelized and they have a little of that lemon zest still attached to them, which is really lovely. And that gets, I'm not going to say that gets caramelized, but I'm going to say it gets slightly roasted. And that also adds to the uh, flavor. Lovely, ready for the oven. So that's going to cook for about 20 minutes at 180 degrees. And then we'll turn the temperature down and cook it for about another 40 minutes at 160 until it's a really good, I like a really good rich caramel on this tart. And if you had a steam function in your oven, this would be a good moment to use that to create a nice sort of steamy, gentle atmosphere. The tart is out of the oven, it's cooked, it's beautifully colored, and it's been resting for about five minutes because I like to allow it to cool a little before I paint on the apricot glaze. And the apricot glaze is what gives it a lovely shine and adds another little layer of flavor. This is just apricot jam that's been melted with a little bit of lemon juice. It just makes it sort of glossy and lustrous. I'm going to sprinkle it with a little chopped geranium and that brings another lovely, highly scented flavor. I like to leave it with the parchment paper still attached. It's a rustic tart from the countryside in Tuscany. So I love the appearance of it like that with softly whipped cream. This is a fantastic combination. Get closer to your cooking with Neff Slide and Hide, proud sponsor of How to Cook Well with Rory O'Connell.